Welcome everybody to episode 78. So today's video, of course, a high interest one for VTS members. It's going to be specific to one of our strategies. But even if you're not a VTS member, there is still going to be a lot of value here because all investors, you have to know how to cycle out of aggressive positions and into safety. Because of course the stock market does crash. This might be hard to believe given the recent action, but it doesn't always go up. So we have to know how to protect capital and cycle out into safety positions. So as always, don't super chat me, don't pay me any money. My live streams are always free, but if you could just give the video a thumbs up for me for the YouTube algorithm. And another little side note, about 50% of the people that watch my videos aren't actually subscribed to the channel. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel right now. Just hit that little button down there and we can get right into to today's episode. So the topic we are discussing today is essentially which asset class are we going to replace back into our strategic tail risk strategy. Now you can see there's a couple positions here, S&P 500, VIXM is a long volatility ETF. But for a little over a year, we've had this cash position, and now is the time to consider putting something back into the portfolio. So just to get everybody up to speed here, our VTS strategic tail risk strategy, this is a tactical rotation strategy. We are using volatility metrics, my volatility barometer, plus several other metrics. We're harvesting those volatility signals to determine which asset classes we are going to be holding depending on what market environment we are in. We can essentially divide this up into three areas, low to mid volatility, mid to high volatility, and then extreme volatility. And each one of these ranges will be a different reaction from us. So that low volatility range, this is what we would call our aggressive positions. This is for stable markets, everything's calm. Typically, you will be in some form of net long equities or net short volatility here. These are the times when the stock market performs its best. The next range, we will call the extreme volatility. We call this tail risk. That's why the strategy is called the tail risk strategy. But this is when the market is all out crashing. These are periods where we would want to try to capitalize on market decline. We don't want to just ride it off a cliff like the vast majority of investors out there. We want to actually have an opportunity to make some real money. And then today's subject centers around here. This is what we would consider our safety range, that ambiguous middle ground when the signals are in between that stability range or the extreme crash. Now it happens on about 30% of trading days for this strategy, but it is a very important segment. What you do here can make a significant difference long term. So those are the three sections for the strategy. And then of course, the asset classes we assign to those are gonna be best suited for that environment. So the low to mid for this strategy, we don't use any leverage. Some of our other strategies, we do use a little leverage, a little bit of short volatility. But for this one, it is just the S&P 500, the SPY ETF. For the high range, this is the VIXM. This is a midterm futures long volatility ETF, roughly 5% of the time, only when we really want to capitalize from extreme markets, but long volatility is very suitable there. And then today, we are going to try to determine what asset class we are going to put back into our safety range. So now getting to our universe of choices here, and I want to explain what this baseline chart is showing. It might be a little confusing if you don't know. So what this is, you can see it says 30% of days. This is what it would look like if within our strategy, just during those safety positions, so only 30% of trading days, what would it look like if we just continued to hold the SPY? So remember, the other 70% is for stable markets or extreme crashes, and that's where the bulk of our performance is coming from. About 20% annualized from that other 70%. So we're not expecting really big numbers here. We are just trying to find something that would serve as a good safety asset so we don't get crushed in a market crash. So this baseline black line for the SPY, you're gonna see this in all the forward charts, but now let's get into some of those choices. The first one we can see here, the TLT, this is 20 year US treasuries. Now bonds are traditionally considered a safety asset. So this is where we're gonna start. And for the first several years of the strategy, we actually did use the TLT. You can see down here, the red line is the TLT. Again, just those 30% of days. So don't expect world beating performance here, but it was actually doing pretty well. It was outperforming the SPY, more consistent, but clearly something happened in the last several years. Now, what is that? As we know, interest rates are now on the rise. 
rise. For those of you who don't know, there is always an inverse relationship between interest rates and bond fund performance. So when interest rates are going up, we would expect bond performance to be poor. And vice versa, when interest rates are going down, we expect bond fund performance to be good. This is why the baby boomers, for example, they do love their 60-40 stock bond portfolios. Because of the declining interest rate environment and essentially a 35-year bull market in bonds, they are under the impression that bonds are a really good safety asset to pair with stocks. That is, of course, not the case if interest rates are rising. So this increase starting in 2022, and of course there was a chunk before that starting in basically 2015, 2016, that is largely responsible for this stalling where TLT just no longer serves as a safety position anymore. Now, the one benefit I will still highlight is if the market did enter an all-out recession, I would still expect the TLT to perform much better than the SPY. So in that respect, it is still a safety position. But as long as the market is in a bull market and rates are rising, it's not a good idea to hold bonds. Let's see if we can do better. So the next one we're going to look at is the IYR. This is a real estate ETF. Now, again, we have used this one in the past, and we can see the performance is excellent. Again, numbers-wise may not seem like it, but certainly up until the last couple years, the performance was way better than the SPY. Now, why the big decline? Well, on the one hand, of course, 2022 was a rough year for pretty much all asset classes, but also there will be an interest rate component to the IYR. It's not as direct as with bonds, but real estate obviously has that element. So that one-two punch there, this is why the performance has fell off so significantly. You would only want to put IYR real estate as a safety position if you were sure that interest rates were either flat or going to be declining. Of course, we'll get back to that in a minute. Let's see some other assets. So this one, for some reason, people love emerging markets. That's the EEM here. As you can see, it is slightly better than the stock market, but on a risk-adjusted basis, it's basically the same. The return is slightly higher, but the drawdown is also slightly higher. And of course, the extremely high correlation to equities, there would be no reason to consider emerging markets a safety position. What else have we got here? This is the XLP. Again, a lot of people just intuitively think that the consumer staples ETF, that sector within the S&P 500, that that would be safety. And that makes sense. Of course, troubled times, people still have to buy consumer staples, but extremely high correlation, performance is no better. I would not consider this in a strategy. What else have we got? The next one is interesting. This is SPHD. Now, what this is, is the S&P 500 High Dividend ETF. Basically, it holds, I believe, 50 right now, 50 low volatility stocks that also pay really high dividends. You can imagine why when the market is crashing down, there is that dividend yield protection there. So this thing is expected to be at the very least smoother than the S&P 500. But as we can see, it also has some boost of performance. Might not seem like much, but 1.25% compounded over 20 years. That is a very big difference. Plus, I would imagine that would be magnified in a real crisis. But it is important to note that this will go down if stocks crash. The next one is something that I do always like to show. I've talked about it a lot in the past. But if you're ever selecting an individual stock that might provide some additional safety during drawdowns, Coca-Cola is actually pretty smooth. You can see here, risk-adjusted basis is much better because not only is the rate of return a percent higher, but the drawdown is also lower as well. Again, though, as far as safety goes, it's highly correlated to stocks. This is also going to go down significantly in a crash. I think it was down about 44% in the financial crisis. Better than the S&P 500 is 56, but still 44% is too much. The next one is the XLU. Now this is the utilities ETF, and I can just say flat out, utilities are the best safety position. For all you non-VTS members, that might be the biggest punchline of today's live stream. If you're ever just looking to dump some capital into something that would be safer than stocks in a crash, well, this is the one for you. Now, for us specifically, this is off the table because we actually already use the XLU within one of our other strategies called defensive rotation. This one is set up a little differently. It uses different volatility metrics to get the signals, but it also uses bonds on the low end, two times the NASDAQ index, QLD, this is the heart of the growth engine, and then utilities for safety and cash on those extreme ranges. This strategy has been crushing it performance-wise for us, but we already use the XLU, so it's off the table. This is just for interest sake, but yes, utilities are great. And then the last one, again for interest sake, this is gold. And once again, 
we are already using gold within our long short volatility strategy tactical volatility again different volatility metrics we get signals from different areas but direct short vol direct long vol and then gold for that ambiguous middle ground this one's off the table as well but gold is actually a decent safety position as well now it's not necessarily because of the performance in good times you can see there's some it's not better than the spy but there's some but again the expectation that if there is really a crisis in the market i would expect gold to outperform stocks by quite a bit. Gold is never a good bull market position, but it will still serve its purpose during bear markets. But let's check out the summary. Essentially, that's what we're looking at. So what we can see, the top performer, aside from the previous two years, is definitely the IYR real estate ETF. Coca-Cola being the most stable, but highly correlated to the stock market. And then TLT being quite good. Again, terrible performance recently, but good expectation that during a real crisis, we would want to have some bond experience. Exposure. So really what all this comes down to is when we would use those two. I would highlight IYR and TLT as the top two choices here. I really don't see much use in using Coke, but because I've actually talked about it in the past, I'm going to show that here as well. Definitely will outperform the SPY in that range. It's really just one of these two. Now, I personally believe that the problems for the IYR should be about over. 2022 was nasty for many asset classes, but also the interest rate rising so rapidly did not help this ETF at all. So for us, at least right now, I will be substituting back that IYR real estate ETF into the strategy. Now, the great thing about having a strategic strategy like this, the underlying rules are not me making guesses as to where I think the market is going. This is all rules-based and quant-based. Having said that, of course, there is a little bit of discretion when it comes to actually choosing the ETFs in these positions. There's nothing saying we can't use IYR for a while, which we will, but always be open to substituting the TLT back in when that makes the most sense. We don't have to be married to this position. It is just most important to have a totally diversified portfolio. So that's why I highlighted and I'll say it again, we use different volatility metrics for each of these three strategies. It's not diversification if they're all coming from the exact same place. So the first layer is that the volatility signals themselves are different between the three. The second point of diversification comes because these thresholds are actually happening in different spots as well. We're not rotating into the other positions on the same day all the time. Diversification means it's going to be different from strategy to strategy. And then the last point of diversification is that we are using different assets as well. Now, like I said, during stable markets, it's not overly difficult to know that you should be net long equities and net short volatility. But when the quote safety aspect really kicks in, you can see we are going to be largely shifting into utilities, cash, gold, long volatility, real estate, and long volatility, again, using the M4 to M7 VIX futures. That is our safety position overall. Like I said, it really just depends when we're going to shift from IYR to TLT, and that is going to be determined based on interest rates. So the last thing we'll touch on really quickly here, when are interest rates going to start to fall? Well, of course, nobody knows that, but what this is, is a dot plot. If you're not familiar with what the Fed dot plot is, each one of these blue dots is essentially a Federal Reserve member making their forward predictions on where interest rates are going to be. So you can see, of course, 2023, it's already passed, but we're about 5.4% now. Going forward, the Fed members are basically varying between unchanged and all the way down to about 3.75. We should roughly expect about a 75 point interest rate cuts this year. Now, it won't be all at once. They're not going to want to scare the market, but I would imagine their token 25 point cuts starting in maybe as early as June, maybe not till September, but I would imagine this year is when we're going to start to see those happen. I think we should be just fine with IYR, and it's not time yet for the TLT bonds, but we will also keep that one in our back pocket as well. So for VTS members, of course, on Monday, you'll see in your email that change has been reflected. It'll say IYR real estate going forward. Now for non-VTS members, again, like I said, hopefully you learned something, a little bit about my process, about how we rotate around with those positions. My work focuses heavily on harvesting the volatility complex to get those trade signals. I feel like there's no better place, no more robust place that you can actually get real indications of market risk being elevated 
or stable markets, and what asset classes pair best with those specific market environments. So now what we're gonna do, just a short word from today's video sponsor, spoiler alert, it's me, but start populating your questions in the comment section, I'm gonna get through all of those. So volatility ETFs, maybe you have questions about what we just talked about, or just general equities trading, what's going on with the stock market, or off-topic questions, I answer everything. So go ahead and do that now. Hey everybody, so please just allow me one minute of your time to introduce my work and then we'll get right into the live Q&A. So I launched VTS in January 2012 with two main goals. First, to crush the financial industry and help investors start making real progress towards their retirement goals. And secondly, to provide that outperformance at a much lower cost. A low monthly subscription fee scales far better than paying a traditional percentage of assets. Now our portfolio is currently five strategies with low correlation to the stock market and to each other, so it's a completely diversified total portfolio solution. It's also not active day trading, and trust me, anybody from any background can follow in just a few minutes a day. Since retiring from pro golf in 2005, I've been an options and volatility trader for 18 years now, and I share a lot of invaluable volatility data from our dashboard in every daily email to subscribers, so you can learn the same tools responsible for my success. I'm also a certified workaholic, and there's a growing list of courses that all members have full access to. There's a free trial to VT available to everybody down in the description below or on my website. Come join members from almost 70 countries around the world. I can definitely help you achieve your financial goals. Now let's get into the live Q&A. Okay, so I can see a few questions in there. Not as many as I was expecting, but uh, go ahead and ask anything. We always just go top to bottom and try to get through all of them. I guess the goal is someday to be popular enough that I couldn't possibly answer all the questions. But you caught me now. I'm, uh, I'm usually able to get through them all. So let's just go ahead and do that, starting with the very top one. So interesting trading day. Looks like the market continued to sell off from Friday. Would love to hear your thoughts. Well, I mean, I think sell off is a strong word. I think, what was it down? 0.65. Um, let's check out what the market's doing now. I think it was down about 0.65 on Friday and down 0.26% today. I know at one point today it was down about 0.6%, but I think sell-off is a strong word. You can see, you know, we've pretty much been raging higher here for quite a while now. Actually, that brings up um, an idea. I can actually show you that blog that I wrote. It's been about four months of this. Where's my articles? And I should also do screen share forget that. Um, which one? We could do the volatility one or we could do the defensive rotation. But we have essentially entered our two times NASDAQ position all the way back in November 1st. So we've just been hanging out, making a huge profit in this trade without a whole lot of action. In fact, zero action. Now this is 59 days and that was written 30th of January. So we went all of February. Of course, it was a leap year, so there's 29 more there. Uh, but those aren't trading days. So we're probably at about 88-ish. I, I think we're getting close. I think I can probably update this chart. I mean, we got very close today to exit it out into safety, though. So we will see. Um, tomorrow's going to be kind of hit and miss if the market kind of recovers again. We've seen that several times where it really feels like it's going to sell off and then it just doesn't. But like I said, I, I wouldn't say this is a sell-off. We, we don't want to get conditioned to think that, you know, a 1%, 2% down period is something to be worried about. That's how you leave money on the table during these trends, is that you're waiting for that day. It's been so long since rotating out of into safety, and you think, well, as soon as it happens, I'm out of here. But it, it actually takes a significant bump to get the market to actually go down. So we will see. It it might last much, much longer. We've seen uh, in the past, I posted that chart, S&P 500, without a, even a 5% correction, the record is 404 trading days. We're not even at 100 yet. So I'm not saying that it's you know going to go on for another 300 trading days. That's over a year. It's 252 trading days in a year. But you know it could. It wouldn't be unprecedented. And there's been several in the 200 to 300 range. So yeah, let's just... Take the market as it is, right? Um, trade the market we have in front of us, not the market we want it to be. And I know a lot of us, my, myself included, 
it's got to feel like we're running on fumes at this point, right? But that just may very well not be the case. So um, if you had time again, would you still have been a trader? Uh, interesting question. I think, yeah, absolutely, because I have my time right now. I, you know, I'm, I'm a lot older than I wish I was, but, you know, I'm almost 50. But, yeah, I can do whatever I want. I actually talked about this, I think maybe last week or two weeks ago, talking about how much time I spend doing the various things. And certainly if I wanted to, I could just shut everything with VTS down, stop doing the live stream, stop writing articles and making videos. And my investment account, while I have not hit my long-term goals yet, I have sort of cleared that, you know, that, that point where I could just coast it out from this point on and be pulling money out of the account and, and I would be okay. You want to reach that escape velocity with your dollar value to where, you know, I wouldn't use the old retirement 4% rule, but if you're pulling money out of an account, it has to be, A, you need a rate of return that is sufficient enough, and B, you need an account value large enough. But once you reach that point, you are essentially what, what I would call retirement optional. And yeah, I suppose that you could put me in that category. I'm retirement optional. But as I've always talked about, I love what I do. I, I, you know, I wake up every morning, can't wait to get into the, you know, start editing videos, start pu putting out new ideas. I'm loving what I'm doing. But I could pivot and do whatever I wanted at this point. I mean, hell, I could <laughs> go start a golf YouTube channel and start doing that. I'm just recently getting back into skiing. I haven't even skied yet, but it's been 30 years since I've been on skis. But, you know, maybe I, I could just be a ski bum for the rest of my life. I can do whatever I want is essentially the point. So yeah, I, what I'm doing right now is exactly where I want to be. All right, do you feel that zero DTE options have affected your vol strategy at all since its inception? No, I don't. I think that if you were to talk about an influence of the zero DTE stuff, I would say the only thing that you're really gonna notice is that it's possible that it's gonna be muting volatility a little bit and then might see some volatility spikes that are sort of outsized reactions to certain things. Like if the market did have a two or 3% down day right now, I think that the reaction to it, especially in the volatility space, would probably be larger than it would have been say five years ago. But overall, I, I just don't think the zero DTE stuff is anything to worry about other than that one shock move could be amplified. So I suppose in that sense, the one day hurtful, you know, change of direction. But on the other hand, if we do get extreme volatility, and it doesn't even really have to be that extreme, but you got to remember that my strategies are definitely designed so that a good chunk of performance can be made when volatility starts to become elevated and the market is crashing. We are not just bull market traders. You know, the VTS portfolio, you know, we could potentially make just as much money on, on the short side, not short the market, but long volatility. So, yeah, if the zero DTE stuff just blows up in everybody's face, I might be slightly worried about day one. You know, it might hurt as we're moving into safety. We might get kicked in the ass as we're moving to safety. But other than that, we're kind of looking for stronger volatility signals anyway. So... I'm not complaining about that. The more people abuse the market, it sucks for the average investor, but if you're a savvy investor that knows how to cycle out into safety and certainly capitalize when the time is right, it can actually be a benefit to you. So um, yeah, that's what I would say. I, I just personally didn't like 2022 very much. I don't think many people did. We saw you know at, at one point a 26% decline in the stock market. Volatility never really did spike up that high. So. I just don't want a repeat of that. That wasn't a whole lot of fun. Now, if we did, by the time that type of year happens again, of course, I will have the full suite of option strategies that people can actually start learning from. Unfortunately, I'm a one-man show, and I just didn't have the time to put out, you know, all the vol all the option stuff that that did actually do pretty well that year. But uh, next time around, we're going to be more than ready. Okay. Avery, I'm curious the backtest results of waiting an extra day to cycle from safety into short vol positions. So kind of the same thing. Cycling between these positions takes place in our portfolio basically daily. So I, I've talked about this before in the past, but just to keep everybody up to speed, 
In the morning, I wait about an hour after the market's open because that first hour of volatility can be bouncing around a little bit. Leave that for the day traders. About an hour in, I input all my data in my spreadsheet, takes about 30 minutes, and then it spits out all the trade signals for the strategies and we take them. So it is one day positions. Basically, intraday doesn't matter. There is no data that shows that taking trades at three in the afternoon is any better than, you know, 11.30 in the morning. It's all kind of the same on that same day. But the signals do drop off and deteriorate, of course, the longer you stretch that out. So if you're talking about next day kind of thing, let's say you're just, you're trying to follow my portfolio, you, you like what I do at VTS, but you're just like, well, I, my boss locks us down and we can't get to our computer at any time during trading hours, can I do it the next day? Maybe something like that. Um, <clears throat> I would say, yeah, I've run the numbers. I did it about three years ago. And the punchline is it costs about 20% of the performance. It's not a total disaster, but of course there is a deterioration there. Now, the only thing that I would say is emotionally, even though the back-tested results show 20%, let's just say something were to happen where my signals were to exit out into safety and the, com the community is out today. And then tomorrow, it was your plan to delay it one day, but tomorrow some type of Volpocalypse event happened, right? That's going to be a much larger emotional hit to you than probably is worth it, to be honest. It, this is, it's just one of those things that emotions play such a large role in trading. And one of the things that will hurt your psyche by far the most is making unforced errors. If I take a trade that has nothing to do with me, you know, I'm in the right positions right now today. We are net long equities, short volatility. We're in one safety position in gold. We're in a market neutral iron condor. The way the market is trading today, that is absolutely the right situation. Our portfolio is in the right spot. If something happens tomorrow that it turns out that the market just crashes tomorrow, that's not a mistake on my part. That's just trading, right? That's just what happens. But if I were to tell myself, well, no, the signal's this, but I can just delay it one day, it's gonna be fine. And then the next day it isn't, this is when you really start to beat yourself up. And you can't take too many of those hits, right? Is Financial capital is the money we trade with, but emotional capital matters as well. And I would be quite worried that it, it's just not a good idea to be actively doing something that isn't ideal. So bottom line, I mean, if you can't follow the VTS portfolio same day signals for whatever reason, then I would say my community is not for you. That's just bottom line. I mean, obviously it would be self-serving for me to say, no, no, don't worry, it's fine. Results wise, it's a 20% hit and f worse than that, it could be a, a real emotional gut kick if, if something were to happen. I mean, there are reasons why I'm cycling into safety on the days that I am. Doesn't mean I'm always right. Some, like today we cycled out of short ball, short vol into gold doesn't mean the SVXY is going to be down tomorrow. Maybe it reverses and goes up, but I know based on the volatility metrics, that is the right decision to make. So we're cycling out for a reason and you should do it the same day. If you can't, 90% of my work is free. My live streams are free. Nobody ever sends, don't send money or anything like that. Articles, videos, they're all posted. You don't have to pay me money to be in the VTS community. It's just, if you want to see the portfolio and the actual trade signals, that's what it's there for. But follow them on the right days. All right, please reiterate why the financial industry is buy and hold because missing the 10 best days is deceptive, just disingenuous. Um, the reason it's deceptive and disingenuous is because it's pulling on people's emotional strings and it's forcing them to stay allocated to things. Because of course it is absolutely impossible to just cherry pick and isolate the 10 worst days. That is not difficult to just point to something and say, look at what a disaster it is to buy and hold or not buy and hold. You, even if you miss five or 10 days, they can show you a chart that makes it look like it's a disaster. But what they're not telling you is a lot of the worst days and best days are back to back. They're happening when the market is in extreme situations anyway, and cycling out into safety can just save you that entire period as well. But the reason that they're doing it, of course, is because, like I touched on in my longer presentation last week, you are dealing with people that call themselves investors, but they're not investors. They're just allocators. They're just putting you into these stupid pie charts 
and doing nothing. There's no investing at all. That would be like a lawyer that never sets foot in a courtroom, you know, maybe on day one and then for, you know, once a year they might poke their head in and see what's going on. That's what these advisors are actually doing when they're doing those pie chart things. They just need you to stay allocated so you continue to pay them the fees. And they will show you whatever charts necessary, even ones as deceptive as that, like miss the 10 days and you're going to miss out 6% of your net worth or whatever it is. Yeah, it's specifically designed to get you to do exactly what they want you to do. But the truth is, and as I've shown countless times, it is A, not overly difficult to know when you should sidestep market crashes and step out into safety, but B, the long-term disaster surrounding those periods can save you tons of emotional capital as well. So yeah, it's, I will always be against anybody who's, who is in even tangentially talking about buy and hold because, well, then you can't even call yourself an investor, can you? Investors are trying to beat the market. That's what it means to be a professional, right? If you're not doing that and you're just all over Twitter saying buy and hold and well, then what are you? You're just a person who writes articles, aren't you? You're, you're more a writer. You're more a marketer. You're, you're not an investor, right? You're not a professional trader at that point. You're just somebody who's shirking their responsibility. We all, in whatever profession we have, and we've got a, probably a large variety of people in the comment section, you're all doing different jobs. It is your job as an expert to be better than, to be the best you can be and to be better than what people can get on their own. That's what it means to be an expert, right? If you're not doing that, then you're not an expert. You don't deserve to call yourself one. So that, that's my objection. And those charts that they show you, that's not the only one, but yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. It, it might as well just say in brackets, because I don't want to lose my income. Like that's basically what that chart is showing. So yeah, little rant there. You've built up such a solid, well-diversified portfolio. Thank you. I noticed that though your annual return. Hey, John McLean. <laughs> okay, let's, let's do this. <laughs> By the way, I've answered like literally word for word. This is the level of intelligence that you're dealing with, with these types of people. Um, this is going to be fun. I'm going to do this live. If you're curious, go back last week and look at the... Um, Look at the question that he submitted. He didn't even change a, a period or a punctuation mark. So that's funny. So um, I got several emails last week. Uh, I'm going to say seven or eight emails from VTS members last week, basically imploring me to stop engaging with the haters. So I'm a person that and you might, if you're a content creator of some kind, if you put your work out there, you might know this, but you're never going to actually know what you should be doing, right? You, it, it's basically trial and error. You have to experiment a little bit. For the last, you know, 12, 13 years, I have experimented by asking, answering every single question, even from people who are blatantly, you know, they've gotten the answer 10 times previously in private emails, but they'll still, they want it. You know, they're, they're looking for that engagement. They, they like that, right? It satisfies them. But what I will say is the seven or eight people that emailed me, I'm going to try that experiment for a little while and not engage with those people. I'm just going to, you know, block and, uh, and move on. And we'll see how it feels. Doesn't mean it's forever, but just temporarily, I think it... Because every time, you know, the, our, our friend John or who was that guy a couple years ago, somebody, mouse, somebody... Um, it just disrupts the flow. So that's what we'll do. I'll try it. I'm, uh, you know, I kind of work for you guys. So if, if enough people tell me, hey, stop doing this, I will stop engaging with the haters. Do you have an opinion on the VIX manipulation lawsuits? There's several. There's always several. They're always ongoing. I don't think they'll get anywhere. And my reasoning is the same as I've always said. It's not that I don't believe that there's a case to be made that investors have been screwed over by, you know, people who are managing portfolios, people who are managing indexes and ETFs and all this stuff, uh, manipulation on the VIX, uh, insider trading, the Congress doing all these things. Whatever it is, I am 
uh, absolutely acknowledging that that is a real thing. My only point in all of it is always, number one, we can't do anything about it. We still have to trade the market that we have in front of us. So I'm not saying you're complaining, like I don't want to use that word, but complaining about the market manipulation and, you know, that everybody's against me and it, it only happened because of these external factors. I personally don't like to do that because no matter what, I still have to get up tomorrow and trade, right? So it doesn't matter to me if the market's manipulated. If it is, well, I guess I have to trade a manipulated market. That's just what is in front of me. The second thing, though, I will say is they have a lot more money than we do. And I guarantee you they have a team of lawyers that have made all the right disclaimers. And these just aren't going to get very far, these, these claims. And even if they did, it would be settled and it would be buried. And the financial news media will not report on it anyway. So really, this is something that it's just an ongoing thing. And it's, it's never going to get solved. Whatever the market is now, that's what the market we have. We can complain about Nancy Pelosi's trading and all this stuff, and I agree, it's just egregious, but what are we going to do about it? I still have positions open right now, and yeah, yeah, the the markets are manipulated. There's insiders doing things. There's people pushing the markets around with high volumes of money that we don't have. There's high-frequency trading going on. It's a massive portion of the market. We have to deal with this no matter what, so interesting to talk about again i'm not highlighting you as somebody who's like complaining you're you're not you're clearly not but yeah trade the market that's in front of us is it manipulated okay let's jump in there and trade that manipulated market that's what i would say why do you think these volatility metrics are best market predictors if they failed in 2022 so that's a good question uh, the reason that i think that they're the best market predictors basically volatility harvesting the volatility complex is because over long periods of time, volatility is the only thing that is consistent through the decades, right? If you're talking about anything that has to do with price levels or certainly nominal values, but anything to do with price levels or crossovers or moving averages or, you know, all these things that people do, correlations and stuff like this, these things ebb and flow over time. And the correlations and the crossovers and the moving averages from the European debt crisis in 2011, for example, are not the same ones that we saw in 2022 in the, in the COVID pandemic, going back to the 87 crash. But volatility, especially if you rank order them in percentiles and you're looking at relative magnitude rather than nominal numbers, it is actually very, very consistent. The outlier, as you pointed out, is 2022. Volatility did not reach those levels where you would signal, oh, wow, this market is really melting down. It was down over 20%, and volatility didn't reach those super high, you know, 99th percentile levels that it usually does. So it failed. That was an absolute failure, 2022. Anybody who was looking for signs in the volatility space to rotate out into safety and to get into those long vol probably was pretty hit and miss. Now, we also, we rotated out reasonably well. That wasn't why we were down. But the reason we were down is because the assets we rotated into were also down just as much as the stock market. What are you going to do? But what I would say is, on my YouTube channel, I have a video that I made just, I think, early 2023. And I was talking about, you have a failure in the market. Volatility metrics didn't serve us well in 2022. What are you going to do going forward? Are you going to optimize your portfolio for the one outlier in the last 35 years? Or are you going to just say, well, it's worked 14 out of 15 times in all of these market crashes, and the one time it didn't, well, we survived and we're fully recovered and we're back well above all-time highs, right? So what do you do? Do you use that one instance and change everything you do? Everything that has been successful for so many years, and I guess I should speak specifically for me, my portfolio was crushing it with this system for so long, well over a decade, and it failed once. Do I now just say, well, it's a different market. I guess I'm going to have to go through and change all the parameters. Or do you just understand that you should always optimize your portfolio for what happens most of the time? Should never optimize your portfolio for what happens occasionally. 
right? The occasional is when we hope to do our best with some market neutral options, with some you know, negative correlation, like our wheel of fun on the VX axis, like my VIX option strategy. Those were crushing it. They were up 25% in that year. I do not want to optimize my trend following strategies for something that only failed once in the last, you know, I've been trading for 18 years now. Volatility metrics are very, very consistent, minus one period. I think that's a pretty good track record, to be honest. So that's the reason. Have you ever explored applying the volatility approach to other markets, Canada, Mexico, India, China, or regions in Europe, et cetera? No, I have not. I, I suppose that is entirely because, well, not in two reasons I can think of on top of my head. One, U.S. markets are by far the biggest, right? It's not even close. In fact, the, I, I saw just on Twitter just an hour ago, the magnificent seven stocks themselves are larger than the Chinese, the entire Chinese stock market, which is the second largest stock market in the world. I think Japan's third. Um, the Just the magnificent seven stocks are bigger than every single market in the world, right? Not combined, but eh, getting close. But yeah, that's the reason is that it's, it's an extremely robust market. But secondly, I don't know if you've noticed, the US markets also perform by far the best. Now you might say, okay, that's recency bias. That's only in the last say 20 or 30 years, but that's the period that I live in, right? As I always say, trade the market you've got, not the market you think you should have. So as of right now, I have no reason to believe the US markets won't continue to outperform. And they are also happen to have the largest, most robust data set as well. So yeah, that's, that's where I'm going to stick to, at least until I have reason to change. I'm always open to change my methods and my strategies. And as I did in my presentation last week, I spend hours a day, every single day, still researching and trying to perfect what I do and testing new strategies. They might all not make the starting four and the starting five lineup in our portfolio, but I've got 15 things I'm constantly testing. So I'm open to change. It's just, I, I got to put my best five forward and they're US based markets, volatility based metrics and uh, crushing it minus, as our friend here mentioned one, one year in 2022, we were down 20% that year, which was uh, not a whole lot of fun, but we, we recovered. So it's not all bad. I read SVXY typically does better in middle weeks of a month, but not as well after the third Wednesday. VIX futures expiration, if accurate, should cycle out of SVXY after expiration and back in later. Um, if this were to be true, and let's take a screenshot of that, I'd be more than happy to research that for you and do a presentation in a live stream. That sounds like a good topic. If this were to be true, it would only be random noise. Right, because the way that volatility metrics or the way that the volatility ETFs work, they are rolling the front two month VIX futures in a constant maturity basis. So it's a rolling period. There is nothing happening on VIX expiration, you know, typically, almost always, third Wednesday of every month. There's nothing happening on that day or the days before or the days after that is influencing in any way, shape, or form the price of SVXY, UVXY, VXX. There's nothing going on like that. It isn't. It might look like a, a big step, and actually it does every single month. You can see, as soon as that front month VIX future drops off the board, you will see a massive step up, if they're in contango, of the, wow, the front month is now all of a sudden so much higher. That's got to influence it, right? Well, no, because it's a rolling 30-day constant maturity VIX future that they are tracking. It is completely smooth through that cycle. So like I said, if this is true, which I can't imagine it is, at least not in a consistent way, it would only be random seasonality that doesn't mean anything for trading. Like I always point out whenever people say these seasonality things, if you lined up the stock market performance for every month of the year, there's going to be a month that is significantly better than one of the other months, right? Does that mean I'm going to sell my portfolio? Like, let's just say it was October's the worst month and April's the best month. I have no idea. Just random. Seriously, I'm going to, I'm going to actually buy and sell. I've got this incredibly successful 12 year track record based on volatility metrics and timing the market and exiting to safety and putting everything together diversified. But I'm actually going to do something based on 
some random number generator that says that April is better than October, that would be insane to me. Seasonality is not helpful in trading. It would be, I'm not saying it, it doesn't exist as a, you know, 13th in line of things that you should consider, but it is certainly not going to give you any robust information. It is just simply, huh, that's interesting. Line up a series of numbers by sheer statistical dumb luck. Some of them are going to be bigger than the other one. That certainly does not mean there's causation there. So I hope that didn't sound like I went in hard on you, but I'm going to research this just to, just to get an idea for what you're saying. But no, it's VIX futures and the way that the volatility ETFs work. Now, for VIX futures traders directly, yeah, I mean, if you were a calendar trader, are you doing diagonals on the VIX futures directly? Yeah, maybe there would be something there when you step up that future. But again, the pricing is pretty smooth. But certainly anything volatility ETP related, no, that's a completely, it's not going to do anything. Okay, how long have we been going? Oh, we're cruising through here. Awesome. Nobody has any off-topic questions? Hey, remember I recommended everybody watch UFC 299? Did anybody take me up on that? That was a hell of a card, wasn't it? And we got UFC 300 coming up soon as well. So I know nobody cares about UFC, but if you are trying to, you know, look for something to maybe get into and watch UFC for the very first time, UFC 300 is absolutely stacked from top to bottom, even right through the prelims. So you're going to have a great time. Have a UFC party for UFC 300. Trust me. All right. Do any of your metrics calculate with fixed strike vol? No. As opposed to VIX, which slides to different strikes as the market moves. Nope. People ask this sometimes. Um, nope. What I'm actually planning to do is at some point in the future, but I want to do it correctly. I want to make sure I'm giving the right information. But I'm, I am planning to give a, create a kind of a spreadsheet that people can download some metrics. And you'll see in that spreadsheet which ones I personally value as being robust for trading. There are certainly some things that you will see on Twitter sometimes people talk about. It sure sounds like it's going to be good. But all I care about is what actually works for trading. It's like in golf, you know. No pictures on the scorecard, doesn't matter what your swing looks like, just get the ball in the hole in the least number of strokes, and that's all that matters. With trading as well, it doesn't matter what you sound like, it doesn't matter how complex it is, it doesn't matter, you know, somebody who has 200,000 followers on Twitter says this is the, you know, the secret recipe. Well, is, does the track record match? Nearly always no. Not calling anybody names out, but nearly always no. In fact, you'd, there might even be an inverse correlation, to be honest. Just from what I've seen, just anecdotally, a lot of the um, volatility guys who, who certainly have large followings on Twitter, there might even be an inverse correlation between the strength of their performance, to be honest. Because I've, I've, I've gone down that rabbit hole before many, many times. I thought, well, that's interesting. Like, he's talking about all this complex stuff. He's saying he's just this great trader and, you know... I wonder, I wonder if I can get an idea of how they're actually performing. And, and you, you can't always, but when you get to the end and you realize, oh, wow, that is just tremendous marketing, isn't it? It's disappointing. But no, everybody can look at their metrics. I, I will try to show you what I'm mostly looking at when I get around to doing it correctly. Hopefully I don't retire soon because I just joined. Yeah, this is one of those open-ended questions, unfortunately. I like how you said retire. One guy said, and what happens if you get hit by a bus? So at least you're saying it correctly or at least politely. But yeah, I'm not going anywhere. I can't say forever. At some point, I'm going somewhere. Hopefully somewhere of my choosing. I'm glad you aren't planning to coast it out anytime soon. Another one of those. Yeah. It just wouldn't be my style. It wouldn't be my personality. I just, I get too much personal pride out of, I guess, how would you say, building up your own body of work, right? It's just, it's too important to me. Not that everybody look at me, I'm so smart or popular. It's just for myself. And if again, if you're a content creator, if you've just started doing this, there is something just so satisfying when you look back and you see that you're doing something, right? You're, 
you're affecting people, you're helping people. I remember the first time, when was my first website? It's called Vix Trader back in 2000, I'm gonna say early 2008, kind of fuzzy. But all I was doing with Vix Trader was a little note, like an, an investor note every month on the performance. And I remember after about six months of doing that, I looked back and it was just a ghetto website. It was terrible. I was using WordPress, or no, was I? I was using, what was that old one called? It was one of those really early ones. This was 15, over 15 years ago. I've been posting publicly for you know over 15 years, but I was just so proud. I was so taken back and it was such a terrible website, but there was just something about it that I thought, wow, I can really put something together here and people are actually looking at this. This is amazing. I'm act people are saying I'm helping them. And then I just, you know, you kind of keep going. So I just can't imagine the day when I stopped working. Wouldn't make any sense to me. What does that even look like? Don't get that. Sometimes people ask me about work ethic, discipline, all these things. I don't even know if I'm the right person to ask because it's so obvious to me that it's everything about our character. It's just not something that's even a negotiable, is it? So I don't know. Maybe I'm the maybe because I look at it that way, I'm the worst person to ask about it. If I have written deep in the money, a, if I've written a call deep in the money for holding stock, become covered selling call. Why somehow it's exercises into short stock before expiration day? So let me just, I, I think I know what you're getting at, but let me just get this right. If I write a deep call in the money for holding a stock, well, so there's your answer. So if I get this right, you are essentially holding a stock and you are selling a deep in the money call, hoping that it's going to basically turn into a covered call when you get exercised. Is that what's going on here? Regardless of what you're trying to do with the stock or the covered call or anything, you have to remember that when you sell a call and it is in the money, at that point, you need to check your trade at least daily, probably a few times a day, to make sure that it's not being called away on you. Because there is a person on the other end of that contract, they can actually exercise the stock. So you are not in control of your short options, and especially when they're in the money. Now, even if they're not in the money, sometimes people just make mistakes, right? So you have to check your trades. If, if you're just anything short, this is one of the reasons why I love my VIX option strategy, for example. Cash settled index, I'm in control of my trades no matter what. I can sell whatever complex structure that I want at any time. I can open 20 contracts. Nobody can close anything involved with that strategy never have to worry about it. If you're in an iron condor on the spy and you're dealing with short strikes that are way out of the money, it is still possible that somebody just makes a dumb decision and exercises a contract on you. So you always have to be mindful of that. Now, around dividends, you have to be extra careful. And when your short strikes are in the money, you have to be very careful. So my guess is that's what happened. It's just a very simple thing that, look, there's, there's not a person on the other side of your your trade, right? This this idea that there's always like a like a counterparty to the other side of the trade, it's more of a nebulous sea of counterparties, so to speak. Like there's thousands of contracts that are short on the strike that you sold. It doesn't mean that there's a guy standing there and you and him are kind of you think the he thinks the exact opposite of you. No, it's just there were contracts exercised and just random dumb luck. Your contracts were paired up in a certain way and they got exercised on you. It happens sometimes even when it shouldn't have happened. You look at your trade. Now, this isn't common, but yeah, it's just one of those things you got to get used to when you're dealing with any options that settle with shares. When you're short, you're not in control of that contract. You just have to know that. And there are certain times when it becomes increasingly likely as you get closer to expiration, if there's dividends, if it's well in the money. But yeah, just get used to checking. And every single day, don't log off without at least giving a look to see what's going on. And just side note, this is another reason why don't ever give your broker the misinformation. Don't ever give them a burner email. Don't ever give them a phone number you haven't used in 15 years. Always make sure that your broker information is up to date. And when they email you, it's one of the first things you see. You know, 
TD Ameritrade, for example, my TOS account, I see emails daily, basically. I mean, corporate actions, just options expiring. They warn you about everything that's going on. And for 10 years, I've deleted every one of them and not a single one of those emails was useful to me. But I still get the email. I still look at the email. Who knows? Just in case, right? So you might get an email one day and says, uh, excuse me, sir, your account is seriously delinquent here. You need to settle this immediately. And you'll be like, what are you talking about? And you log in, you think, oh, wow, look at that. I had a, something exercised on me. That means my trade's now lopsided and all of a sudden my exposure is, is ramped up, right? You can fix that if you see it happening. So just be aware that as option traders, especially on the short side, you're never totally in control of your own trade. Okay. You mentioned an upcoming course that would allow subscribers to use the method to trade. When is that coming and how will it work? Yeah, I've mentioned this a lot. People are just begging for it. And I've actually made some serious progress, so I can actually report on that. But yeah, we, for years, you know, when you see the VTS brand, so to speak, hate to talk about it in a business sense, but when you see the VTS brand, you might assume that it is this portfolio, right? And this is what we do. But this is VTS, right? This is the Volatility Trading Strategies portfolio. But we also, for a number of years, had VTS options, separate service, separate email, option strategies only. And I just got too busy. So I had to choose one or the other, and I chose VTS. VTS options was shut down. It's been a while. It's been, you know, what is it, a year and a half, two years at this point? Apologies. But yeah, it's definitely coming back because I started my career as an option trader. I've been doing this for 18 years, but I wasn't trading normal stuff in 2005, six, seven. Option trading really resonated with me. The, just the analytical aspect of it, it's way more fun. You know, there's more action, there's every day. You never get in that situation where, I mean, personally, with our defensive rotation strategy, I'm not complaining that it's up 60% or whatever it is in the last four months without exiting a single trade. I'm not complaining, I like money. But option trading does allow you to get in there and mix it up and trade multiple things and you know, structure your trades in a, in a much more specific way. So, you know, it's not just price, it's price, time, volatility. It's, it's just a lot of fun. So that's absolutely coming. When? Not today. I also read that if one had bought SPY at the end of each trading day and then sold the next morning at the open, the return is 500%. Is that accurate? So what you're talking about, let's see if we can search my website. Or no, where is it? Right there. What is this? Here's the website. Let's, I don't know. Let's see. I can't remember. This sounds like something I would have written about. So uh, spy day versus night. Let's see if something comes up. Uh, day versus night. Short performance day. There we go. I knew I had, oh, it's a video. Can't really talk about it. All right. Well, anyway, not totally wrong. If you look at the S&P 500 performance overnight is where all the action is happening, right? During the daytime session, it's really not a whole lot is happening. So I, I think what I even labeled that article, I don't know why it wasn't transferred over. I've switched websites several times. Like I'm just tech illiterate. So I went from WordPress to, was it called Divi? Something like that. And then I went to Wix, and now I'm with Kajabi. But every time I switched my website, I didn't take over all of the articles to the new website. So, I mean, I've written well over a thousand articles over the last 12 years, but they don't all survive every time I switch websites. But that sounds like an article I wrote. I think I even called it, is the S&P 500 nocturnal? I'm pretty sure that's what I called it. And yes, you're not wrong, but you haven't factored trade fees. And you have to remember, too, that all the drawdowns are happening then as well. So it's not as simple as just doing that. That's a seasonality thing. Again, there are many, many, many things that you should be factoring into your trading before you get to seasonality. I mean, seasonality is as low as it could get, as non-robust as a signal could possibly be. So I would not expect that to continue. And in fact, I again, I'm going by memory here. 
but I think it's already broken. I think it's already in the last 10 years, just totally, you know, not working anymore. So no, don't do that. I can't give direct investment advice, but no, that's a, even if, even if it were robust, you're never going to make trade decisions based on something like that. It's just silly, totally hit and miss random number generator, line up any sequence of numbers. You're going to start to see patterns. Human beings are pattern seeking creatures. We're going to think we've found the answer. No, you really want to make sure that when you are using something to influence an actual trade with real capital, it better be something better than, Hey, that's moderately interesting that there's a pattern over there. That's, you know, don't get me started ranting on all the people that use technical analysis for their trading. Like, oh, this pattern, this, do you see the bear flag? I see something. My, I have a human brain. I see something, but am I going to use that for a trade? No, I am not. Agree with not engaging with haters. It's hard for me. I, I want to help people and just wish they could see why are you doing that? Because it's, it, it, it's them. It's not... <laughs> I, I wish they could see that. Social media is such a disaster. I wish people could see what it's doing to them. But I will try my best not to engage with people. I, j I know I'm one of the good ones. So if you've got a problem with me, God, you've got problems with thousands of people. But uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I guess if I'm on the radar, I'll take it as a compliment. I understand that VIX calculations are based from S&P 500 options, correct? Is there a similar indices to view a term structure for the Qs, NDX, something like that. Is that right? Sometimes on live streams, your brain freezes. Yeah, there's volatility indexes on a myriad of things like the NASDAQ, the, the Russell, the bonds, Apple, you know, all, all these things, they have volatility indexes underneath them. Are they as robust? Well, the S&P 500 is by far the largest, uh, largest data set that you're going to have. It's the largest volume. It's it's the one that I would trust the most. I guess the only differentiation would be, do you trust the VIX or do you trust the volley? Because the VIX is SPX options on a full strip of options. And the volley is just spy options and just at the money. So personally, I believe that even though the VIX has the brand name, the volley is probably much more useful information. I've heard Jem Carson mention quarterly OPEX being significant for vol to unpin the market. Do you agree with this in elevated risk around this time? So this is another thing. I mean, I'm familiar with his work, of course, but look, he's, he's on a lot of podcasts and I know he's popular. So I, I you know, I, I would never hack on anybody. Plus I like him. I think he's at, you know, entertaining and whatnot. But the one thing that I would say that he doesn't do a very good job with and it might be intentional, so maybe that's not even a knock, but he doesn't seem to make it clear the difference between a certain event is going to produce a more volatile market versus actual actionable trade signals around that event. These are totally separate things. So I would agree with him, just quantifiably speaking, you can prove that this is correct, but as far as gaining any actual trading edge based on it, there's nothing there. There's no there there. It's the same as these gamma exposure people. I understand the theory behind it. No problem. And we can point to the numbers and we can see the data. It's real and it's there. What to do with that information, that's what's all nebulous and meaningless, right? It doesn't... Tr knowing something is going to produce certain dealer reactions and certain increased volume and certain certain things, it does not mean that you can use that as an active trade signal. And so look, not calling him out, I've actually never seen his specific performance, so I'm not calling him out. But people on Twitter who talk about these events, when you look at their performance, it sucks. And the reason it sucks is because they're very good at identifying data and talking about data and making it sound really interesting and complicated and they're up here and I'm down here and I want to learn from the master. They're very good at that. Again, none of this has to do with Jim, but they're good at that part. But what they're really not good at is saying, okay, well, 
if X, Y, and Z then do this and here's the results that it has produced in live trading. That's the part that's missing. All right, so all of these volatility guys on Twitter sound like geniuses, but there's no trading results coming from that data harvesting. So is it even worth listening to is the real question. You can dive down the rabbit hole of all the gamma exposure and the, the, the VAMA flows and all this stuff. You can do that if you want, but there's no actionable trade signals coming from that data. So, you know, wade into those waters carefully, I would say. Do you care about making real money or do you care about sounding cool and intelligent? I'm the money guy. I'm the person, I've been posting my performance for 15 years on a public website with public people, third party, paying me money for those signals for 15 years. That's all I care about. Do I care that people think I'm the smartest guy on Twitter? I mean, I don't even tweet. I hate social media. But there is a massive gap on Twitter between what sounds cool and what works in trading. Do not mix up these two things. They are not the same thing. Tyson versus Paul. Um, Jake Paul's going to destroy Mike Tyson. I, I hate to say that because this is just, this is one of the saddest things in the world to see. But I, I just think people, A, people are sleeping on Jake Paul's skill, his size, his speed. You know, people don't like to admit it, but the guy is actually decent. Is he world class? Hell no. Fighting Canelo? Stop it. But Jake Paul is good. He works his ass off. He's a mega millionaire that chooses to get punched in the face for a living. You probably want to take the guy seriously. Secondly, Mike Tyson's 59 years old. I mean, aside from landing one single shot, which all Jake has to do is stay off the ropes and cover up. But man, I posted it on Twitter. If Mike Tyson knocks out Jake Paul, he might, the hit that he gets off that, because he already has a very successful podcast. And I mean, Mike's the man. Everybody loves Mike Tyson. But the hit that he's going to get off that, I mean, he might be the most popular person on the planet for the rest of his life. Uh, that would just be, I'll be watching it. I said, I'm interested. I'm down. I just think it's, it's elder abuse. I mean, what are you doing, Jake? Well, He's winning fights and padding his pocket is what he's doing. He's a smart businessman. And yes, unfortunately, the 27-year-old, younger, faster, at this point, stronger. He's got decent enough defense at this point that he's probably not going to get caught with anything. Yeah, it's going to be ugly. It's going to be ugly. And you're going to see Mike Tyson look really old. Whatever you thought he looked like in the Roy Jones fight, it's going to be significantly deteriorated from that, unfortunately. But I'll be watching it. Take my money. You got it. Um, I'm in. Any running shoe recommendations for someone who walks a lot? Um, well, the best running shoes, period, point blank, are the Asics Super Blast. If you want to just cut through the mess, you see a lot of running shoes here. I've got 15 more pairs of running shoes back in Taiwan. I'm a running shoe guy. Um, I test everything. Running shoes are that, you know, there's different types, and each brand has four or five targeted at different things. Let me just save you the time. Now, the Super Blasts are really expensive. They're probably approaching 300 bucks, but let's just save you all the time of testing them out. They're the best shoes ever made. Asics Super Blast. You could get the Nova Blast 4, so maybe write this down. The green pair right, that green pair right there, that's the Asics Nova Blast 4. They're at least $100 cheaper, and they're almost as good. Um, Super Blast is number one. Those are number two. Number three, ASICs are great for just regular walking as well. So I'm kind of an ASICs guy, but I have shoes from every company. The ASICs Gel Nimbus 26 would also be much cheaper and super comfortable for walking. They look cool too. So one of those three, but if you want to just get the, the OG shoes, there you go. Super blast. Sound good too, don't they? Do you always allocate the same percentage of the total portfolio account to all the strategies? One of the most difficult things for, to me is how much to allocate in each strategy. So no, it's not always the same, but it's always posted. So last year, for example, we had five strategies. We had another one where we were doing VXX and UVXY broken wing butterflies. That was the volatility trend. Still a great strategy. It's just for reasons that I actually think I talked about on the website. Let's just go to articles. 
don't want to be called a liar. Our volatility trend is taking a break. So you can maybe read this article if you're interested in it. But yeah, essentially, right now, we've got four 25% each. Now, leave iron condors out of it because those are options, and options are very capital efficient. So you can't possibly open 25% iron condor. That would be an insanely large position. So we actually use 3% allocation per trade, right? But everything else, this is the full 25%. So if you have $100,000, you put $25,000 in the SPY. This one's switching positions today. So you put $25,000 of your 100 in GLD gold. Defensive rotation, $25,000 in the QLD. So ETF strategies are just the allocation, right? That's the most efficient way to do it. If it has a 20% allocation, because we have five strategies at the time, you put 20% of your money into that ETF on that specific day. Options are different because options are super capital efficient. So, and there's the full, don't forget the Iron Condor mega course. There's over 30 videos in there teaching everything about the Iron Condors. And one of them is discussing that allocation size and why you can't possibly put in more than say 3%. 3% is plenty. Um, Follow-up question, is there a VXN 93? No. No, that, no. I don't think so. I mean, I wouldn't use it anyway, but no. What you're getting at is the, the VIX 90, VIX 3M, 6M on the NASDAQ. No, I don't think so. But it, I'm not familiar. I, I don't want to say for sure. It would be something I wouldn't care about even if it did exist. But there's a ton of volatility products out there. Half of them I probably never heard of, so... Um, let's just say tentatively no, and even if there is, don't don't use that. You don't think it would be mostly exhibition, like Tyson Jones? Um, no, I think that. No, I think that they're both going to want to win. I think that the only reason it's called an exhibition is because no state commission would sanction Mike Tyson to be boxing. Well, also, I think there are rules. I don't think Jake Paul's legitimately even a cruiserweight, so there are state sanction rules about how many weight classes below somebody you can actually sanction a fight so um remember that was one of the problems with uh conor mcgregor the only reason they got away with it because conor actually used to fight featherweight in the ufc so um i don't think a commission would sanction mike tyson versus jake paul i don't think jake paul has officially fought above middleweight has he so you can't go two weight you can't go three what is that I mean, and then if the middle ones, like super middle, super middleweight, then cruiserweight, then super cruiserweight or whatever they are. Um, no, it's, it's exhibition in name only. I think they're both going to want to win. I just don't think Tyson can win. It's just unfortunate. You'd think, oh, Tyson for sure. But no, I don't, I don't think he... I think Jake's four years, he's got decent enough defense. I don't think he's going to get caught. He'll probably just stick the jab, keep moving. He's going to win a super boring decision and Mike's going to look real old. Why don't use SVIX and just allocate 50% capital? There's a good question. The TER makes less of a dent in absolute amounts and you can get the risk-free rate with the rest. You can. There are, I mean, the SVXY is slightly better. If you're doing this, breaking it up, actually the one times SVXY, two times SVIX, or half SVX, one times SVXY, the SVXY will probably slightly outpace it. But you're not wrong. You could do this. It's one of those complexity issues that when I'm sending out trade signals to people, you just do the easiest thing that you can do. And the SVXY is, is great for that. Um, it's like stock replacement. You can replicate any ETF you want, as long as it's a liquid options market, and you could do that as well, and there would be benefits there because the long stock options that you would be using are not using the full amount of capital, and you could dump, say, half your money into the SHV, for example, just a short-term money market fund, and currently it's making almost 5%. So you could do that, and you could get that extra bump. What you're saying is you could also do that with SVIX. Sure, but I don't think it would make any sense. But the other thing you have to worry about, too, is that... With volatility ETFs, you do want to... I don't think a Volpocalypse event's ever going to happen again, personally. I don't want to say ever, but it's certainly in no danger now. 
but you wouldn't want to use the SVIX if you have the SVXY able to use. Because once it crosses that certain margin, that threshold, they can shut down the fund and they can, you know, basically accelerate the fund anytime they want. It would take an awful lot to cause SVXY any problems, but SVIX is closer to the problem-ish range. Now, I don't think that's a good reason, but it's something. I just don't like the SVIX. That's why we use the SVXY. A couple of years ago, a French service was selling an option Rhino service based on your barometer. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar. <laughs> it was the most profitable service they ever had. Well, I didn't know that part, but oh yeah, I'm familiar. I'm familiar with all the people that are stealing my work. Uh, unfortunately, there's nothing I can do about it because it is a subscription. And I mean, I've, I've seen asset managers who you'd probably know who they are on Twitter. You'd, you'd recognize their names who are subscribers and selling my signal, or I don't know about selling them directly, but pawning them off as their own information. I, I've had people <laughs> literally posting my emails with my charts. Sometimes people send me stuff. They're like, are you, are you seeing this? This guy just sent me this email. And it's literally, they didn't even take the time to change the charts. And if you're, I mean, just to get an idea for how staggeringly stupid this is, let me see if I can find one. I actually have my branding in my charts. Like it says so right here. I've seen this duplicated in other emails from other people. I've heard, I've had people calling it their volatility barometer, their strategic tail risk. Like it's unbelievable. My, take it as a compliment, obviously, but no, there's only one original work here. All my work, you will not, the only way you'd ever find something that looks similar to what I'm doing is if somebody's stealing it from me. This is original work, my total portfolio solution, the way we put these strategies together, the volatility targeting, the barometer, it's mine. And I know it's mine when I see it in other people's. But yeah, the one you're talking about, there's several in Europe actually that I've been tracking. Now, unfortunately, I don't have access to how they're using it, so I'm not familiar with the fact that I guess they say, I guess they say it's doing pretty well. Probably not in 2022, right? But most other years we're doing pretty great. Yeah, that's interesting. What are you going to do? You know, there are other people who probably, probably feel that about di different types of trading. Like if it's, if it's robust and it's good enough and unique enough, you should expect that it's not going to be long before people start to imitate and copycat. It's easy, right? I've had copycats doing my tactical volatility strategy, multiple of them, in fact. They all crash and burn. They're all gone. They just surface for a year or two. The people realize, well, nobody's really following anyway, so they just scuttle it and move on. But yeah, there's... I could throw out names, but I don't even want to advertise for these clowns. I don't even mind if somebody does something similar, credits the people where credit is due, and, and maybe build on the work, right? That's part of it, right? We're, we're all in some capacity standing on the shoulders of people that came before us in some way. I've always said, you know, at least in the early days, I learned a lot from Bill Luby and his Vix and More website. That's it. I'm not sure it sparked my trading strategies, but it certainly got me interested in the space and how to start exploiting it. And I'm the first person to give credit where credit is due. Yeah, Bill Luby's, he's the man. He's the one, I would say, you know, you could say Vance Harwood, but Vance never really had a trading strategy. He's more on the, reg, like the regulatory side, super interesting articles. You should read them all, by the way. You should, Six Figure Investing, you should read everything he ever puts out. But Bill Luby at the time also had a direct volatility strategy before I did. He's the only one, well, there's another one. There's called Market Sai. Um, I had a friend in Taiwan, actually, who ran a website who I met him through the website, not because he was in Taiwan. He just happened to be there. But yeah, um, there was two volatility strategies before I launched mine. Hey, Bill Luby was one of them. So, but I am the last man standing by a long shot. Um, all of the rest have crashed and burned or they're all just copycats that surfaced in the last three or four years, right? Everybody's a volatility trader now, but you know, 
myself and a couple other people, we were doing this when nobody knew what these products were. I have a video on my YouTube channel showing my first VXX trade. It was like 6% of the daily volume that day. And I'm not a baller back then. Um, it was it was a $60,000 trade or something. It was so early on. But yeah, um, Stephen Aniston from VIX Contango. I am aware. Yeah, I think he's long since crashed and burned. I think his strategies really fell off a cliff. You can really start to tell. I don't want to trash talk the guy, but although he was he was a dick, right? He he was one of these guys that has to block thousands of people just because he's such an aggressive in your face type of person. But um, you can kind of tell when people are starting to fall off when every month they've got a new strategy on their website with a full back test and they're you know explaining how awesome the results are and it just popped out of nowhere like the, that's one thing that you can't say about me is that my strategies they these things have been going for a long time right and when i do launch something new which does happen um it, they've been trading behind the scenes for quite some time but we've still got original strategies like our our tactical volatility this thing is, it's the same strategy as in 2012. Like this is what it was. It was here. Um, iron condors have been in my portfolio since the first day. It's the same strategy. It's the first day and it's still here, right? This one, this one, th like seven, eight years, eight years. What was the, the original uh, tactical balanced I would say has only missed 18 months of the last 12 years. Yeah, so that's just side note, but that's the one thing I noticed about uh, Steven is that right, right after his strategy started to fail and he moved away from the volatility stuff and into the selling data stuff, I just noticed like every couple of months, I, I, he's got a whole suite of new strategies. I was like, okay, it's, this is going off the rails. So yep, I, I know all those people. such a fine line between hacking on people who you do want to directly like I care about you guys I really do and there are times when I would just like to say in the clearest most uncertain terms stay away from that person right because I know I've seen them all I've, I've been here since the beginning it's 15 years ago I've seen them all come up and all crash and burn there are certain people that you would just want to say, guy's a clown, stay away from him. But I, I try to be the polite Canadian. So, all right. I think this is the last question. I'm researching some machine learning based strategies. How do you suggest getting peer review on my work hypothesis? How about the risk someone would copy my work? Um, copy your work. Is that something to be concerned about? Originally, I was going to say, don't, don't worry about that. If it's, if you're the first one moving and somebody copies your, well, it is a concern though, because if somebody who's more popular than you right now copies your work, it's going to look like theirs, right? I guess that's how history works is that it's not who did it first. It's not who does it best. It's, who's the most popular doing it, right? You can, you can get these people, and you see them all over Twitter these days, these financial Twitter accounts, they know nothing, right? These people that are talking about, oh, I was a millionaire at 27 and I invested in nothing but index funds. Word, is that what you did? You made 8% a year for three years since college and you're a millionaire because of index funds? Really, is that what happened? But I mean, these people have no life experience no financial knowledge whatsoever. So the stuff they say is so laughably stupid, but they don't know it, but they've got 100,000 followers. So whatever they steal, I would say time will work itself out, right? Eventually they will realize that they, they know nothing and people will just leave. But the fear is that the popularity will override the laughable nature of their content. And so, yeah, I, I guess I... My knee-jerk reaction was to say, don't even worry about that. But yeah, you should worry about that. Keep it private until it's until there's a way to to brand it. 
and make sure that it's yours and that you can you can keep your proprietary information to yourself. As far as the strategy, how would you suggest peer review? Peer review, it's not a thing in our industry. If you feel like auditing your work, do it. It would help, right? Is it a three, four, or five year track record? Totally unnecessary. I mean, 99.9% .9 of the financial industry doesn't show their performance. So this is not something that you, you need. Are you helping people or hurting people, right? If you share your work publicly and it's good work and you're actually helping people, then just share your work. The internet's free for all of us. It's right there. Just do it. That's your peer review. But if you don't know what you're doing, then don't, don't do this. Don't be one of those people. But yeah, just share it. I always say that. Just, just go. I didn't originally set forth doing any of this for a job or for income or any of that. I was just private trader, posting my results, writing articles, and people were interested. And it took three years, but eventually people started saying, hey, you know, just if I send you 50 bucks, can you send me the trade signals? And I was like, yeah, sure. And that's how the, the subscription was born. But from 2008 to 2011, I didn't ask anybody's permission. I just shared my work. I didn't seek out peer review. I didn't do any of that. I was just like, I've got ideas that I think are valuable. I'm going to put them on a website. I'm going to write about them. And I'm going to post the results every month, good or bad. And there were some bad. I actually wrote about one of them. I did a video on one of them. I lost $70,000 in a single month, May, no, March 2011. Lost 70 grand. Now that was 17%. I shouldn't say dollar values. That's doing the whole nominal thing. 17% in a single month. And I posted it and I did a video on it and it's still on the YouTube channel. Yeah. You don't need my permission. Go for it. Blue face, smiling. Were you the one that asked about the boxing or Steven Anderson? Okay. I don't know what that means. Maybe I said something that you agree with. Yeah. He was, he was a rude guy, wasn't he? Knowledgeable, knew some stuff, but I would have made different choices if I wanted to actually have some staying power in the industry. I, I should look him up, though. I, I have not seen what he's been doing in the last three, four years. I have no idea. I know his website went private and he started selling data. And that's all I, that's the last thing I heard of him. So, um, cool, we did that. Oh, I went way over. One hour, 26. We were rolling there. I was 45 minutes in, we were almost done and then questions kept coming in. So once again, you kept me late or I kept myself late. All right, cool. So I've got an idea for that SVXY question. I'll dive into that research. I I'm just going to say flat out, no, don't trade seasonality. But uh, that'll be an interesting, interesting little experiment. Bitcoining. All right, well, can't argue with anybody Bitcoining. I, I had my two down to one. I sold at 66,000 and it's now, what, at 72? It won't be long, and I posted it publicly, right? So it's on Twitter, it's on YouTube, it's in a live stream. It won't be long before I get an army of people laughing at me. They're gonna tell me it was the biggest mistake of your life. You sold Bitcoin at 66,000. It's never gonna see that price again. Well, one, I have an extra Bitcoin just in case that I still own. And two, I think it's impossible for me to, to believe that at some point it won't go below 66 again, so. I'll keep going. Oh, wait. Thanks for the running shoe recommendations and live stream. Yeah, no problem. If you don't care about money, Super Blast. If you do care about money, Nova Blast 4. Name unavailable until it's there. It's not simple to make machine learning with algo, all based on engineering features. That is a huge part of trading algo. Are you saying you can't do it yourself and you're worried that if you, if you share your work to help somebody build it for you or with you, that somehow they're gonna steal it from you. That's what business agreements are for. Now they're not foolproof, they're not airtight. I mean, sign your NDAs or whatever you need to do, start a official company, incorporate, do it wisely, right? Because 
intellectual property theft is a thing. Right? I, I deal with it all the time. There's half a dozen services I know right now that are profiting off my work. But I'm in a position, there's nothing I can do. I don't have any contracts signed. I just send out signals through emails. And half the emails that I, I can see the emails, I can see, you know, sometimes you can find their website through it. Hundreds and hundreds of asset managers, right? So I know that on some level, you're telling me that somebody subscribed to my service, they're managing capital, they have 200 million under management, and at no time are they using my work to influence where their client's capital is going? Of course it is, right? But, you know, if, if there's no disclosure, then they just say it's original work. So yeah, be super careful. And if it's good, share it with the world. You might get rewarded for it. All right, cool, everybody. So uh, see you next week.